Welcome to the tribe. Today, we have an interesting video. Why a huge chunk of Earth's history is missing. Now, this channel that we're watching this video on is a channel that I've loved for quite a long time. I haven't watched a lot of his content lately, but years ago, I used to watch quite a bit of it. So I always put a link down below if you guys do enjoy this, want to go down that rabbit hole a little bit more, feel free to, but let's dive in. Let's, uh, let's unpack. The biggest mystery is how we lost a billion years of history. This is far more serious than when you found your keys in the bread bin because there's a colossal blank spot in our planet's past and nobody's quite sure where we put it. To put things into perspective, a billion years is almost a quarter of Earth's existence and yet there's a billion year gap in the fossil record that geologists call the Great Unconformity. Okay, I did not know this. Let's dig a little deeper, shall we? Speaking of which, if you ran outside right now and started to dig, you'd uncover older layers of rock the deeper you got. First, you'd find an Alanis Morissette tape from the 90s, maybe a disco ball from the 70s. But eventually, you'd excavate some Roman coins and other assorted artifacts. So, why is it that both human and natural remains sink deeper into the Earth as time passes? Well, the Earth's surface is constantly being littered with fine particles like sand and dust. This sediment accumulates in an agonizingly slow process called deposition. Then, in another process called cementation, these mineral particles gradually bind together until, a few million years later, and sedimentary rock is formed. Then, another layer of rock forms on top of that, then another and another, and so on, until the ground beneath your feet is like a trifle. A rock trifle, with millions of layers made over millions of years. And not a single one of them contains custard. What a <laughs> tragedy. But during all this sedimentation and cementation, animals are doing their usual party trick of dying. <sighs> All the soft squidgy bits get eaten or decomposed, but sometimes the harder bits, like bone, shell and husk, get covered in dust, slowly succumbing to the sedimentation, thus becoming encased in rock. Over time, water penetrates this rocky tomb, which dissolves the biological remains within. Eventually, minerals fill that void and form a fossil, which of course is just a rock replica of the creature that once resided there. Importantly though, that fossil is frozen in time, enshrined in the sedimentary rock from the era in which the animal lived. Much of our understanding of the history of the planet and life itself has come through studying the sequence of sedimentary rock layers and the treasures they've trapped through time. Often the different layers, called strata, are clear and distinct, with each revealing something unique about the age it was formed in. The stupendously fun pastime of studying strata is called stratigraphy, and one of its guiding principles is the law of superposition, which states that, if undisturbed, the lower down the rock layer, the older the rock. Not exactly rock, it's science, but it does mean that generally when you're looking at a cross section of geologic formations, you get a fairly neat picture of the passage of time. But unfortunately, history isn't so predictable. Whilst new layers of sedimentary rock are being formed in one location, in another, conditions can change, and sedimentation just stops. Wind and water erosion can move particles elsewhere, effectively deleting part of a geologic record. After a while, sedimentation might resume in that location, but these temporary interruptions will forever leave a gap in that rock's record. And sometimes that gap, called a hiatus, can be millions of years long. It's like hitting pause, rewind, and then record again whilst in a very long conversation. In the final recording, there will be missing parts that are irrecoverable, and if these parts are integral to the meaning of said conversation, then the whole thing will no longer make any sense. When these hiatuses happen, it creates a noticeable difference in the angle, colour and texture of the new rock that sits on top, as can be seen here and here. Geologists call this feature an unconformity. It was Danish man Neil Steenson, considered the father of stratigraphy, who first sketched an unconformity 
back in 1669. But it was a Scottish farmer called James Hutton who discovered the first significant unconformity. Whilst walking near Sicker Point in Scotland in 1787, he noticed a striking difference between the lower and upper rock formations, and so he coined the name for it, Hutton's Unconformity. If that name sounds a little rude to you, but you're not really sure why, join the club. Anyway, the greyish lower layer of rock is made up of deep sea deposits from around 425 million years ago but the reddish upper layer was deposited by rivers and streams about 345 million years ago. That's a hiatus of about 80 million years. It was on the back of this discovery that Hutton helped develop some major theories about the movement of tectonic plates and the forces that shape the face of the Earth. It's wild to me that they were figuring this stuff out and coming up with theories and like in the 1600s and stuff. I don't know, it just, it doesn't seem like we would have been Able to understand that, but I guess it's just people way smarter than me. Some geologists call Sicker Point a geologic shrine, which tells you how incredibly strange both this formation and geologists actually are. However, the most unusual unconformity was found in 1869 when John Wesley Powell was observing a strange mound. I just realized I don't think this guy has a hand. There's no hand. Hopefully he's all right. Whilst traversing the Grand Canyon, he noticed a vertical rock formation butting up against horizontal formations. Channeling the supreme creativity of his geologist predecessors, he named it Powell's Unconformity. But since then, it's been more commonly referred to as Powell's Great Unconformity. And there are two striking reasons why it's deserving of a great. Firstly, the unconformity actually spans an entire continent, stretching across Laurentia, which is the name for the ancient heart of North America. Secondly, many other unconformities had been unearthed around the world at this point, but they mostly represented small gaps, on a planetary scale at least, maybe tens of millions of years. But the smallest time gap between the two rock layers in the Great Unconformity is a modest 250 million years. And the biggest is over 1.2 billion years. That's wild because like the amount of stuff that would have potentially been there. That's right. That missing piece of prehistoric pie sandwiched between these two unassuming rock formations represents up to 1.2 billion years of missing history. And we have no idea where it went. But there's so much more to this rocky weirdness. Since Powell's grand discovery, a few more formations have been found all over the world that have the same time period plucked from their record. Together, we collectively refer to these as the Great Unconformity. It's a mystery that spans the entire planet and over a billion years of missing knowledge. Take the Grand Canyon example. Here, the 525 million year old Cambrian era Tapiat sandstone sits snugly on top of the 1.7 billion year old Visnu basement rocks, dating back to the Precambrian era. Like I said, a time gap of 1.2 billion years. Weird, right? Scuttle over to the Ozark Plateau in Missouri where we see a similar site. 500 million year old sandstone sits suspiciously atop 1.4 billion year old granite, representing a 900 million year hiatus. For the sake of all that is igneous, what's the metamorphic heck is going on here? Well, some have suggested a theory to explain the Great Unconformity, and it's called the Snowball Earth Theory. It refers to a time during the Cryogenian period, around 650 million years ago, when the Earth's surface was thought to be covered by glaciers and ice sheets, like a giant snowball. Glaciers are capable of causing erosion on a massive scale as they grind across landscapes. And it's been estimated that they collectively removed two to three miles from the Earth's surface. Basically, the Earth had its face exfoliated. Now, 
Do you remember me saying that the younger rocks that sit atop the Great Unconformity all around the world date back to a period called the Cambrian period? Well, what's really interesting here is that the Cambrian period was when the biggest explosion of life in our planet's history took place. During a tiny timeline of only 11 million years between approximately 541 and 530 million years ago, the original ancestors of almost all the life forms we currently know today sprang into existence. For example, this is when fish first appeared. There was life before this event, sure, but this short window was when Mother Nature downed a Red Bull, snorted some cocaine, and hit the big evolutionary boost button. I didn't expect that, but I mean, listen, I heard Mother Nature gets down sometimes. We, we see what be happening out here. <laughs> I so like this. how does all this relate to the Snowball Earth theory? Well, when all these ice flows started to hit the ocean, they deposited gargantuan quantities of nutrient-rich minerals into the water, where, the theory goes, it was responsible for the aforementioned explosion of life. Over one billion years of sedimentary rock was just carved from the face of the planet by glaciers, then plunged into evolution's breeding ground, the ocean, where the many minerals contained within acted as a catalyst for life as we know it today. So, in the end, it looks like we did lose a billion years of history down the back of the sofa, only the sofa in question turns out to be the bottom of the ocean. But Snowball Earth remains a theory, one that was only posed as recently as 1998 by Dr. Paul Hoffman. Okay, so that's interesting. So they're, they're saying what it is, is that those part, okay, fell into the, uh, and that's what, so, brought, oh, okay, that's interesting. Whether or not that's true or not, I like that as a theory. I mean, I'm sure there's, there, I'm, I'm curious if there's any others, but. And if you ask me, two decades doesn't seem like enough time to definitively explain a billion years of missing history. Maybe someday new techniques or technologies will rock the geology world and enable us to fill in more of the missing gaps in our planet's very long, very empty history book. Facts. I like this. Shout out to my man Thoughty too. I like him. Link again down in the description. So I'm assuming when they say snow earth, they're saying that everything had kind of frozen and similar to how we see icebergs break off you know, in Antarctica, so on, or whatever the case, it, it just kind of what happened. And that is a theory as to why we're missing those certain chunks and places. And I guess, I mean, that's definitely a possibility. Um, I feel like as time goes on, we may find some other stuff out though. I don't know. I don't know if I'm sold on that. Comment down below. Let me know what you guys think. If you guys do agree with it, smash that like button. Let me know. Uh, yeah, new videos every single day. We might dial down at some point to two videos and a short or two every single day, but at some point we'll probably up it back to three. Regardless, every day we got content, so I do appreciate you guys if you enjoy it. Uh, smash that like button. Hit that subscribe. I will uh, I'll see you next video, homie.